Hi, I'm Michael Patterson and I mix and produce records. Over the past two decades, I've been working with artists like the Notorious B.I.G., Beck, Black Robo Motorcycle Club, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, Lady Tron, Spleen United, Nephew. I really got started making music probably when I was 16, when my mom was on a trip to China and sat next to the music director of the TV show Lifestyles of Rich and Famous. He asked to hear some of my music, so I watched the TV show and wrote some music like that, and then I was in high school writing music for the TV show Lifestyles of Rich and Famous. I got started in studios by playing live, and one day a guy came up to me and said, will you program on a record of mine? And I'd never really been in a studio. And we went in the studio that was a dream studio in Memphis called Kiva, which had an SSL and a Quad 8 and this amazing room with every keyboard that I'd ever dreamed about. And all the keyboards were on the floor in disuse. And I set them up and used them for the session. And the owner of the studio was like, no one's ever used this room. Why don't you just take it over? So here I was, 17 turning 18, and I had a Fairlight, a PPG, everything you could ever dream of that I read about in Keyboard Magazine was sitting in the room, and it was mine to play with. And because I had the studio, and that studio the main rooms were used for all the hip hop in town. I started to work on hip hop while going to goth clubs at night when I was 17, 18. Because I was the only person who knew how to use the MPC 60 and all the gear, all of a sudden I became the go-to guy for programming and making music. So this was around 1988 and I, met a couple of producers in town, and with what I was doing with programming, because of my influences with Art of Noise and Yaz, created something that was akin to like industrial R&B with a producer named Arnold Hennings, and I was his programmer. So we were in Memphis working with a record label named Mega Jam, and things from that label were getting signed to labels like Elektra. And Arnold was from Chicago, so we started going to Chicago to work on R&B records up there, but this was the heyday of ministry and Wax Tracks records. So I was at you know, Chicago Tracks in one room doing urban music. In the other room, ministry was making the sounds of screaming, and I would go to Smart Burr every night. So all those influences kind of blended together. During this time period, we worked on an artist that I can't remember the name of, but one of the background singers was part of the Dallas Austin camp in Atlanta. And he took the cassette back to Dallas Austin, and this was probably 91, 92. And then Dallas moved us down to Atlanta, which is where we started working with TLC and all of the artists that he was working with. I've been mainly mixing these days because I do a night called Cloak and Dagger and between that and mixing and some other things, I just had this realization that spending 14 hours a day in the studio doing vocals with someone wasn't where I wanted to be right now unless I really, really love the music. Mixing, I can be on my own, I can be creative and 80% of the time the artist doesn't come to the mix, I send it to them, which is actually great because they can hear it on their system and hear how they normally hear it, and then come for the last week of mixing and really tweak everything. So it's more of a lifestyle preference right now than anything else. I would like to think I have a special take on mixing. I just mixed an album for Yard of Blondes and they they came in and they were listening to the music and they were like, what we like the most is the you made our mixes sound like how you feel in your vibe. I would think that my vibe doesn't work for everyone, but I would think that whatever I like I would hope I would impart in their music and make it extra special, more so than it already is. I mean, I would think influences for me, as far as a mixer, you can't deny the influence of Bob Clearman, of Alan Mulder, of Andy Wallace. Like, if you look at those three, they are part of everything I do, probably more than more Bob Clearman than anything else, which is really kind of, I never really thought about that till recently when I put together like a list of the influential records of mine. I realized that, you know, when you're 14 to 18, almost every record was a Bob Clearmount mix. I mean, the Lord Alge brothers, Chris and Tom, I produced a record that Tom mixed. The mix was incredible. And I just wanted the hi-hat up a DB. And he was like, no, I'm not gonna turn it up a DB. And I'm like, what? And he's like, no, you paid for a TLA mix. This is a TLA mix I want you to hear. And that was like, a, it went off in my brain like, oh my God, you can do that. And at that point it was like, oh, this, it gave me more confidence to say, this is my mix and 
I like this. Of course, I'm gonna listen to your changes, but it made me more confident in my, like, here's the mix, I think you're gonna like this. You know, I grew up listening to Alternative and then grew up listening to Urban. So if I include the Urban, now that I'm thinking about it, you can't deny Tony Maserati, you can't deny Serban, you can't, you know, Dave Way, John Gass, like these people are the, probably the backbones of what I do. And even, um, what's his name? Oh my God, Steve Hodge, who did Janet Jackson Rhythm, Rhythm Nation. Like that's a, that changed mixing as we know it. And if you haven't listened to that record, I highly recommend it in the headphones.